Welcome to the Expository Songs Podcast. We discuss songs where the main idea of a passage of scripture is the main idea of a song. My name is Daniel Mount, and today we're discussing the song Faithful to Forgive by Greg DeBlink of the New Scottish Hymns Band. Welcome. Hi. Glad to have you here. Uh, if uh, Listeners, if you haven't heard this song, I would encourage you to pause the podcast and listen to it on your favorite streaming service. It's also linked in the show notes. And then I'd encourage you to come back for the conversation. Uh, so, Greg, before we talk about the song Faithful, Faithful to Forgive, I'd love to start with your background. Uh, could you please share how you came to faith in Jesus and also your background as a musician and as a songwriter? Yes. Well, um, thanks for having me on the podcast. It's great to talk about these things. Yes. Um, I was was brought up in the church. I'm Scottish, uh, in case you haven't figured that out from my accent already. I uh, have lived in the central belt of Scotland all my life, and I was brought up in a church-going family. It was a gradual unveiling mm -hmm. of what Christ was working in me rather than a kind of Damascus road yeah. experience for me. So while there have been kind of certain emotional moments and other kind of formal commitments like uh, joining the church, um, I don't tend to look at these as particularly significant because the, the stuff of that I've done has been incidental and it's all about what Christ has done in me. So I, I find it hard to pinpoint a specific um, moment, but I just love seeing how uh, God has worked all things together from my good and how he is shepherding me and working with me even though i'm i'm a sinner and even though uh, i'm really slow to be transformed it's great to see that the spirit is um transforming me so that's kind of a a, a short overview of, of my story really before we jump into the songwriter and musician part i actually want to chime in on that because i can relate to that my testimony is very similar i grew up in, uh, I had the blessing of growing up with uh, dedicated Christian parents and growing up in church. And while there definitely was a moment when I thought it through, like, yes, I want to own this for myself, commit to it, be baptized, etc. You know, but it was a very gradual thing in my case as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a good friend who I've done some songwriting with, who has the same sort of testimony, but he's in a traveling band. And one time, he was talking with somebody who asked him, you know, what day were you saved? And he was like, I wholeheartedly believe in Jesus saving faith, but I grew up in a Christian household. It's hard to pinpoint an exact day. And this person just kept not coming after him, but kept pressing him. Yeah. And eventually he said, okay, fine. I was saved 2000 years ago on the day Jesus died. That's the day I was saved. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like that well, comeback. How, how about even further back than that? Do you know, like, True. Um, oh, well, you know, in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation. Yes, exactly. Yes. So God, God knew that He was going to save us, but um, yes, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think it does. It does feel a little bit artificial to yes. have to point to those kind of things, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot, a lot of people when they're talking about their testimony, they're like, "Oh, it's a kind of boring thing." It's like, "No, wait a second. If, if Christ was involved, this mm -hmm. is the king of the universe who decided that you were going to be adopted into his family. So that's not boring, do you know. He, he, yeah. <laughs> and and I kind of I fall back in that. Do you know, my life my life might have been fairly uneventful by you know conventional standards, but um, I'm just so glad that Jesus has saved me. You know. Amen. Uh, so then I'd also love to hear about your background and in getting into music and, and your background as a songwriter. Okay. Um, so musically, I, my dad, um, who was also my English teacher at school, was quite musical. And uh, my parents got me to learn piano and cello when I went to school. Um, and with my dad being my English teacher, I developed quite a passion for poetry as well and um, just language generally and I'm just one of the things that I would say I'm hugely defined by is a kind of passion for communication and trying to understand how to communicate better and I have a kind of grand theological vision about God as a communicator and how we are to um, 
you know, think his thoughts after him and be communicators as well. But um, that's getting ahead of myself. Uh, I decided that I wanted to learn guitar when I, I think I was about 12. And I heard the Queen song, One Vision. And I remember where I was driving in the back <coughs> of my dad's car when it came on. And I was like, that sounds amazing. I just want to learn that. So I got a guitar and um, I just, I, I picked up uh, playing the drums as well. You know, playing with chopsticks in my, my uh, desk at home. And eventually my parents got me a drum kit. So I've, I've kind of learned a few different instruments um, and I can play most of them to a reasonable level, but not at a kind of session level. And studied music at uni. I've been running a Cayley band, which is a Scottish wedding band, basically for traditional Scottish dancing that happens a lot at Scottish weddings. And uh, I've been doing that ever since I left uni, where I, where I uh, focused on songwriting and recording and also music business so that's been kind of all of the the things that i've done and that's that's kind of brought me to this place where i started writing hymns i, I suppose i had a few years where i had a, a kind of um, attempted career as a dance music remixer mm -hmm. but um that didn't really come to anything i worked for three weeks and get paid 50 pounds you know so it was mm -hmm. like this <laughs> this isn't good to um It'd be a sustainable business model so uh, yeah <laughs> so i decided then to write hymns because as everyone knows that's the way into the big bucks <laughs> <laughs> hmm. so that actually brings me to my next question <coughs> which is what prompted you to start the new scottish hymns project i've heard you share a little bit about this on the hymn partial podcast which sure. I believe they retired the podcast, but this older episode is definitely still out there, still available on YouTube for anybody who'd like to go and listen. They, they, they'll they definitely get into some aspects. They got into some aspects I don't get into in this interview. So if you enjoy this interview, definitely go check that one out. Um, but for those, I'm, I'm going to guess many of the listeners here probably haven't he heard that particular episode. Uh, so for their sake, if you can share a little about how this project came together. So the New Scottish Hymns project came off the back of a kind of a folk music singer songwriter Christian collective project uh, paradigm um, that was being uh, organised by a guy called Jason McCauley who had a Christian yeah. arts um, organisation called New Scottish Arts and it was New Scottish Choir and Orchestra. So New Scottish Hymns was going to be a hymns project. And he got me to produce um, that first album, which is called New Scottish Hymns. And we involved a variety of uh, Scottish singer-songwriters like Emily Smith and Steph McLeod and mm -hmm. Ellen Oliver and Yvonne Lyon. Um, I did most of the writing for that album. And uh, we we also... We also had um, Songs of Praise as a as a British kind of TV mm -hmm. show, kind of uh, it's BBC, religious right? BBC. Uh, yes, it's it's kind of a, a light religious um, yes program, you know, and it, it has a kind of very um, twee. I don't know if you know that word twee, uh, but <laughs> I've heard it. <laughs> yeah, it just it just means kind of um, very prim and proper. Yes. Uh, classically English really um show. But anyway they they did they did a Scottish um episode and they were looking for Scottish uh musicians and they contacted New Scottish Arts about that and I said, Well look, uh, can I write a song for, for this? And uh, they said yes, but it'll have to be in by the end of the week. So I that was the first one that I wrote was Sam one three nine for that and they liked it so that kind of started that and i think that kicked off the whole the whole project and that's been one of the songs that has been um i think sung most widely uh, that we've yes. uh, written actually yeah that was my introduction to your music was that song i heard it 2016 or 17 within about a year of when that album came out uh, and, and I love that song and, and still love it. And I yeah. and up uh, to the listener, by the way, if you look around on YouTube a little, I believe that uh, that 
episode of the not episode that's performance from the BBC episode is out there on YouTube. Yes, I do. You know, I think we've actually got it on our um, uh, on your channel. Channel, yeah. Probably it is. YouTube, I, I have so. seen it on YouTube, and I th last I saw it was still up there. So the song I'd like to focus on today is a song called "Faithful to Forgive." Um, I started listening to you. Uh, after I heard the 2016 album. So I probably heard Faithful to Forgive when it first came out. I think it was the next album. I think it was 2018. But for whatever reason, I didn't really dive into the song and, and come to appreciate it to the level I do now till last year. I was doing a podcast series in this podcast of the best songs from First John. And we had an episode in chapter one. And my guest and I, you know, we didn't compare notes on this. Uh, but it just we did our separate preparation going through probably a hundred plus songs from chapter one. We both selected this as our number one pick for best congregational song from John one. Uh, <clears throat> the title comes from first John one nine. So I'll read verses eight and nine for context, which says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, could you share, to the extent you might recall, because it's been a few years, could you share what sparked your initial idea for this song? Well, I think, um, in terms of, I, I, I think it was really just out of a response to how it feels when you know that you're confessing the the same sins again and again mm -hmm. to God when you if you've prayed that um you would act better in in a certain situation than you you ended up doing if you've lost your temper about something or you know if you know that you've prayed earnestly about something and then realizing oh no this this is something that I've done again and I need to confess it again I think that that can be quite a just it's quite a harrowing thing uh, to do yes. because you're you're coming face to face with your own inadequacy and your own failure and that is not something that it feels particularly um attractive to do you know you need to have faith in uh, the power of forgiveness and you need to uh, know that um uh, what you're doing is is worthwhile to, to do that otherwise you can just run away from it so uh, I just wanted to kind of encourage um, Christians as they sing that to actually engage with that and realize that repentance is has just got to be part of our um, daily interaction with God you know we need to confess our sins in order to um, uh, in ensure that they don't have more power over us than than they need to you know then yes because christ has already a uh, robbed them of their their most fundamental power to condemn us so we can confess them and his blood will cover them so why wouldn't we you know so it's just it was trying to encourage um people along those lines you know and remind myself as well as as i'm singing it thank you yeah so your site has a devotional for this song. I will plan on linking to it in the show notes. But there's one thing you mentioned in that devotional that I thought might be interesting bringing into the chat here. It mentions it's almost like a tension in First John between how on the one hand, John says, um, everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. And, and then he also says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And this tension seems to be almost at the heart of the problem that is introduced in these opening two verses, because you have two verses before you get into the first chorus. Um, the more we know of God's grace, the more we lament that we shun his gaze and hold his love in contempt. And, and we've been forgiven before, but our shame for sinning again tempts, tempts us to keep away from his throne of grace. Uh, so can you share any thoughts you have on that tension and how that kind of plays into these opening verses and how you started to pull the song together? Yeah, well, I think that the tension comes from the <clears throat> the fact that we have 
a new identity and Christ has given us that new identity um, and has imputed his righteousness to us okay. so that when God looks on us, he sees us as righteous because of Christ and and his atoning work. Uh, and because we are united with him, we have that identity. And yet we are in, in that strange in-between place where um, sin has not been dealt with uh, uh, and finally and uh, you know because of that we still have um, you know the sinful tendencies and, and the, the the old Adam um, still uh, fighting to um, have as much uh, of us as um, you know the devil wants as much of us as they can get kind of thing mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm realising as well that the um, that passage that says it does not keep on sinning is per perhaps more talking about the trajectory of the believer as well. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, sin. If you are a, if you are someone who knows Christ and is known by Christ and is saved by Christ, sin will just consistently um, become less and less attractive to us. Um, it will not be the solace that. Um, we once found from it, you know, it just it will become uh, ugly to us, um, and I think it, it reflects that as well. So, so I guess that's a kind of a third aspect to it. But I think we've got to hold these things. Um, <coughs> I, I don't know if holding them in tension is the right is the right um, maybe not phrase for it yes. because they they kind of they run concurrently. You know these yes. these truths about. Um, uh, knowing that you, you have a different identity now in Christ and knowing that sin has nothing left for you and yet still um, feeling the temptation of the lie of sin. So holding all those things in tension, I think that was really where I was coming from with that. And then we move on to the chorus, which, as the title says, celebrates that God is faithful to forgive, which echoes First John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Uh, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and then as a, as a response to that, it calls us to uh, uh, bring those sins before the cross and stand accused of them no more. Do you recall <coughs> if this chorus was your starting point in the writing process? And, and you kind of wrote that and then wrote something to lead up to the chorus? Or if you started with the opening verses and those kind of brought you to, okay, this is where our response is. I, now I can't honestly remember. Okay, no problem. About about the the kind of the order, the, the organic kind of nature sure. of it. But I I it, it would make sense to to regard that as the kind of the anchor point or the kind of main hook of the song. Mm -hmm. Do you know because um, sometimes uh, I'll often have a kind of lyrical and melodic hook. Um, that I build the song around, but sometimes it's a melody that grows off the back of a chord pattern, and mm -hmm. then I establish what kind of themes fit that emotion. Um, so I might kind of go, you know, if I've got do 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 do, I might think, oh well, and he is faithful to forgive. Uh, you know, yeah. I might have some kind of Bible verse that fits that, and then the whole song expands from that. I'm not quite sure, but it certainly is the central. Um, part of the song and it's intentional mm -hmm. that that kind of high lift in the melody um, is the point that focuses on Jesus and yeah. the quality of his forgiveness that it is faithful and it's it's so amazing to um, just reflect on the fact that Christ's Christ is faithful so even when we are unfaithful Christ is faithful and you know that's just such a wonderful truth it is. to remember and it's faithful to forgive us as well you know um i i i, I don't think we were able to get our heads around it. i think we just have to um sing those words and wonder at how wonderful christ is that he would be so faithful to us and and his forgiveness and to that end i think this is a song that that we need to sing that there's so there's so little in the hymnody that I have around me that would be commonly be sung in my circles that really speaks specifically to this theme. Um, 
there's there's definitely songs that speak about forgiveness songs like before the throne of god above that speak to jesus as our high priest and intercessor and those are great and we need them but we need this reminder of his faithfulness to forgive us even when we have this hesitancy um there's just uh, as we talked through songs from the chapter there's very little on that theme and it's something that we need to be reminded of yes yes I have a, a specific question I didn't quite understand in verse 3, uh, which <coughs> begins with the freedom that his cross achieves, how slow we are to understand, transforming power each one receives each day from God's own gracious hand. The how slow we are to understand part, does that more connect to the line before it or the line after? Well, I, I would say, I think it's it's a kind of bracketed reflection on both of those truths. I think. Okay. It's, it's primarily related to um, the freedom that the cross achieves. You know, I think we are kind of slow to understand that. I think that is something that mm -hmm. gradually, I, you know, I think that if you say to somebody, Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins, that is a, a mind-blowing truth but it can appear as just something that just seems like a non sequitur. It's like, what mm -hmm. what does the death of this man 2,000 years ago on, you know, a Roman torture instrument have to do with me and, you know, the things that I have done wrong, do you know? And actually understanding how that actually means that we are free and how, how we have mm -hmm. uh, freedom uh, to... You know the the freedom of um it's like having having a passport so i've got a friend who uh, was who came to the uk illegally and uh, was an asylum seeker and mm -hmm. uh, after a long period of um uncertainty he received advocacy um for somebody who said he couldn't go back to his country of origin and he spent a long time in this kind of limbo state of not knowing and it was very depressing very hard for him it, it did a terrible story but then he, he finally uh, got his freedom leave to remain in the country and he's he's getting his passport um i'm not sure if he's even got it now but that kind of idea of actually no now you're a citizen um uh, he's he doesn't necessarily think about his citizenship every day mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't think about his passport every day but you know, now he can go and get a job and now he can go and, um, you know, get a mortgage and, and mm -hmm. you know, buy a house. And, you know, he has he has all these rights now um, that he can avail himself of. And so I think we are, in the same sense, we are slow to understand how um, we can actually be free from sin. You know, without Christ, we are always going to be enslaved we are always going to be slaves to sin and um, we don't fully realize just how we don't need to depend on sin anymore we don't need to depend on these uh, idols that we have set up for ourselves anymore and um, so i think that's the thing that we're slow to understand and the fact that um, because god's spirit is living within us we are actually being transformed daily and we can take part in that um, work and we can facilitate that and we can um, uh, by our obedience and by our repentance we can facilitate the transformation of our souls and the sanctification of our souls so I think these are things that we don't necessarily uh, think about, we don't fully understand, we're slow to understand them, I certainly feel that about myself I, I feel like I, it's just such a thick head and a hard heart and um, but it's so wonderful that God is still working with me in that in that sense. Amen. You know that that's a good analogy, an <laughs> and an interesting analogy too. Uh, I, the, when somebody leaves one country and, and the identity of their birth to become part of another country and goes through that country's citizenship process. There are a number of analogies I've heard drawn from that. Um, 
as pertained to the Christian life, because there are some parallels to us leaving the kingdom of this world and becoming a part of God's kingdom and, and pilgrims and strangers here and citizens on our way to a heavenly country. Um, but I've never heard this analogy extended into this area of uh, forgiveness and confidence. And it was very interesting to hear um, the analogy used in this context. So when I look at the first half of the fourth verse, on first glance, I think it's eschatological or pointing to the end times, uh, where it says the darkness soon shall pass away before the sun of righteousness. Uh, and maybe I'm predisposed to kind of come in with that mindset because so many of the, the grand old hymns of previous generations end with an eschatological final verse, whether that be fourth or otherwise. But then the second half says, saints usher in that glorious day and let no sin stay unconfessed. So does this second half point to us understanding this uh, in the present day? Are we speaking of darkness passing away in our own lives as we walk in the light, you know, 1 John 1, 7, with our sins confessed and forgiven? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's it's, it's probably one of these both and things, isn't it? Yes. I think that, I think that when we see come Lord Jesus, we are ushering in the kingdom. Yes. In a sense, that is, you know, the, the kingdom that is already am among us, but one day will be fully realized. <clears throat> so we are just um, aligning ourselves with the desire to see that kingdom fully uh, realized. There's a kind of um, prophetic duality mm -hmm. in scripture where um, when you come across things and you're not sure if they refer to the, the now or the not yet, and there isn't so much um, an either or tension, but it kind of reflects the kind of typological nature of creation. You know, one thing points to another. Mm -hmm. um, so things that we practice here in our limited earthly reality reflect a greater future realities where the spirit and flesh will be gloriously united. You know, so that that. Is already that process has already begun in us, um, so it's 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 both ushering in the kingdom in our lives at the moment and also looking towards the end times, um, and you know I think I think that um, God's kingdom uh, manifests wherever He is acknowledged as King and wherever mm -hmm. He is obeyed as King and Christ is given His uh, place as the um rightful king and um so it's just it's really um about that and the process of confession really is about us being done with sin availing ourselves of the endless forgiveness that's been poured out on us so that god's kingdom can be established <coughs> um so I, yeah i think in terms of ushering in the eschaton um we acknowledge that uh, you know the the Christ of God in His rightful place. You know that's holding that dual meaning. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does. It does. I mean, <laughs> do you know what's what's really quite interesting is the the kind of questions that you're asking. Um, these are the kind of worries. See, whenever you're writing hymns mm -hmm. uh, for the church to sing, I really, I really want to avoid anything that would be, contr obviously that would be contrary to scripture. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I think it's very easy to, um, if you have a naive um, or un underdeveloped theology, things that you you can be tempted to write things because they have some kind of aesthetic uh, value, but they don't necessarily reflect the truth of scripture. So I, I, I do appreciate questions like this, but it always brings a little bit of a sweat on because I'm thinking, mm -hmm. have I written and released and published and sung and promoted a song that actually might be slightly heretical you know? <laughs> so there's always that tiny little fear at the back but i don't i don't think that I is think, I, 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 I was i was I trying to right. reflect yeah. reflect the kind of scriptural but I, it's, I think as long as people realize as well that when they're singing songs um the songs don't don't come under that um blanket uh, uh, mm -hmm. of um uh, the the authority of scripture you know you have to you have to always um, sing songs with your eyes open 
I think. Yes. Well, as someone who I also have an interest in songwriting myself, I, I understand and share that concern. So I get it, and I, I have that concern. But I I bring songs to feature on this podcast that I really think will stand up to that scrutiny. Uh, so if a song is one that I'm bringing onto this podcast, I'm pretty confident that it stands up to those questions. Stamp, stamp of approval. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> um. You know, th- this topic is, is you know, there, there are other songs we could have focused on that are maybe more of, of a fun topic to chat about. This one's a heavy topic, uh, more more so. Uh, but I do uh, thank you for your thoughtful and thought-provoking answers uh, on, on these questions as we, as we reflect on these issues. I do have a couple of general questions, but yeah. before we move on to those... Was there anything else in the song that you might that you, you think might be interesting to the listeners were you to mention it, be it lyrical, musicality, arrangement, even how it's been received or used? Uh, is there anything else that like comes to mind? You know, that might be interesting to mention before we move on to a couple of general questions. Well, I think that I just want people who are singing the song, I want them to feel the pettiness of sin. Hmm. I think that... You know, like when you measure yourself against the power of the devil and the power of evil, Mm -hmm. you know, you seem so small and evil seems Mm -hmm. so big. But then when you measure that power against the power of Christ, it is just Mm -hmm. immeasurably more powerful. And, you know, understanding that if Christ is for you, this this little um, insignificant, uh, you know, worm, oh worm Jacob, uh, to to quote to quote the scriptures, you know this person of insignificance. If you're being given significance by Christ, then you have that significance, and that can't be taken away from you by by evil. And what I guess what you really want people to come away realizing is the pettiness and the the emptiness of sin, and mm-hmm. you just there is this wonderful mechanism that has been given to us that is confession you know before god we can just confess our sins to god and he will forgive them and those sins will uh, cease to have that same power over us and and they can just be exposed for the the um the pretenders that they are Mm -hmm. you know they don't they don't have the power that they pretend to have so I would just want to um, want people to use this as a way to dial down into that um, great source of s- strength. You know, before Christ, it was this huge, looming, intimidating shadow, this mountain of fire, and it was, you know, pregnant with threat. And because Hebrews of 12. Christ, yeah, it is. It is. Um, become this thing that will just evaporate into nothing Mm -hmm. so just just be rid of it just you know it's so good to walk in the light of christ so just you know cast off that sin that so easily uh, entangles yes and run the race hebrews 12 and and, uh, psalm 103 as far as the east is from the west so far as he removed our transgressions from us these assurances Yep. yep amen so moving on to a couple of general questions, uh, this podcast is based in the United States and all previous guests have been Americans. Uh, so you're this podcast's first international guest and it's a delight to have you on. Right. Um, right. Okay. So sir, are, are, you, are you, are you not, don't you mean that um, I'm, cause I mean, everyone's international to someone really. This so is true. Say, all, all of your guests so far have been international to me. This is true. Well, I would say that. <laughs> You're the podcast's first international guest from the vantage point of the country of origin of the podcast. <laughs> That's right. You, you, need, you need to bear in mind that Scots have got a big chip on their shoulder. You can't quite okay. see it, but it, it will come out. It comes out in, in a variety of ways. You know, we don't we don't like being the, anything that even suggests that we're not the best country in the world, obviously. You know, well, that's okay. one that's thing you have thing to deal with. One thing you have going for you is you have the best accent in the English language. Scot- Scotland has that going for you. I-, I love the Scottish accents. Absolutely true. 
Oh, and you can you can exaggerate it as well if you want to really impress people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. sorry, sorry. No problem. No problem. <laughs> um, and, and it's fun. So we had we had um some fun chat before I hit the record button and it's fun, fun to bring out that part of the conversation into the episode itself because we've just been talking about these heavier issues. It's fun to have that, uh, that spectrum where we can lighten it up a little too. So I have a question, but I almost have a preliminary question to the question. So like the context is I'm familiar with what congregational music looks like across different faith traditions in my country but I know almost nothing about what's going on in the last generation or two in Scotland. But my preliminary question is, like, I don't know if evangelical is a good term for the church in Scotland, or if I should use a term like free church to signify churches outside the church of the, the established church or church of Scotland. What's a good term to use as I were to frame the question? Well, I, yes, I mean, I, I think... Evangelical is still a term that a lot of churches um, okay. will will use if they're kind of Bible believing, Bible -believing uh, holding yes. to the scripture. Um, but the the church in Scotland is quite quite similar to a, a, a lot of different places. Scotland has become quite a um, secular nation, um, yes. an extremely secular nation, um, and religion I think generally is regarded with a kind of quaint curiosity or it's regarded as a kind of negative and anti-progressive um, mm -hmm. ideology, you know. So those, the, or you know, it's just it's just something that people don't even engage with at all. So the mainline churches in Scotland, like the the Church of Scotland particularly, has largely, um, particularly from the top down, has acquiesced to the kind of uh, progressive mm -hmm. demands of the the kind of leftist cultural agenda and as a result it's in a b little bit of a state of free fall in terms of membership and churches closing. Um, meanwhile there's the individual churches or churches that are associated with um, like the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches mm -hmm. FIEC or um, my own church is a, an Anglican church but mm -hmm. Anglican connected with the, um, the Evangelical uh, global South Anglican um, yes. Church, as opposed to the Church of England, which is also which is also um, has drifted as far as the Church of Scotland has. Uh, yes, yes. So farther. we actually, yeah, and we used to be part of the Episcopal Church as well, mm -hmm. um, which uh, the Scottish Episcopal Church, which um, preceded the the Church of England and the Church of Scotland and its its views. So I mean, it, yeah, I I I think there's there's obviously all these challenges, and I'm not I'm not here to kind of a uh, to uh, bash a, a variety, all these different um, denominations and stuff, but there, there is the kind of real, um, there's the challenge of, are you going to stick with uh, the authority of scripture or mm -hmm. are you going to try and um, adapt uh, the message to, to suit the culture? And you will never be able to do the latter. And that's kind of sad. Yeah. So it's this, I think you're probably, you're, it's, you're seeing the same kind of polarization as you would be seeing in the US. Definitely. I think because Scotland is a smaller nation, um, all of these all of these different churches are ve very much close together, you know, um, and uh, just down the road from one another. Yes. So, and I, and I like how you put it. It's a good general term: churches that uphold the authority of Scripture, and that's probably better than any one term. So uh, among churches that uphold the authority of scripture, uh, do you, I imagine you have somewhat of a spectrum. I'm just curious what the <laughs> spectrum looks like among churches that might only sing the older Watson Wesley hymns. Uh, do you have, there, there's a few exclusive psalmody churches in the U S that only sing psalm paraphrases. Not many, yep. there's a few, but I've, I've, I've heard of some in the, in, in the British Isles. Um, how strong a presence does modern hymns have? Do you have a lot of churches that sing the latest hits of Bethel and Hill song, and that's largely what they do? I'm just curious what the spectrum of worship music looks like. Uh, all what's churches, common, what's well-received in, in Scotland? All churches in Scotland have a, a bagpiper, and we all just sing along with the bagpipes. 
Uh, and then we go out and uh, we we go and hunt haggis. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm happy to say that that is not true entirely. Um, but no, I've, uh, up north uh, in the north of Scotland in the Highlands, you've got a lot of free churches, mm-hmm. and the free churches, a lot of them will sing exclusively psalms. Okay. Some of the more uh, progressive free churches that aren't really progressive, but a little bit more open to. Um, contemporary worship songs and we'll sing Getty stuff they'll sing new Scottish hymns um, sometimes they will sing just uh, like Sam paraphrases mm-hmm. but contemporary Sam paraphrases um, some of them won't have instruments and will just just be uh, a cappella singing mm-hmm. and you will you will often find if you find a, a well attended church up north of Scotland that just do a cappella singing, you'll get the four part harmony and it'll, it'll sound fantastic. Um, where I am here in Glasgow, you get a lot of churches that sing, that are in the kind of charismatic end of things, that will sing the Bethel and Hill songs and mm-hmm. um, all of those kind of things. And then there's the whole spectrum. My own church, we, we tend to sing hymns and worship songs as a mixture. Uh, traditional mm-hmm. and modern and we try and kind of keep it as 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 broad as possible and we've got quite a nice um, model in our church which um, has all the worship le- leaders of all the different worship teams mm-hmm. we we meet together every few months and we discuss the songs that we're singing and we bring in new songs and and they they have to kind of get past the panel kind of thing and we mm-hmm. say well is the theology of this right is it something that is singable does it does it fit into you know what we're teaching about and all these kind of things and i think it's good to that if churches actually have some kind of process that involves um selecting hymns and songs yes. that are suitable for the congregation and has a good rationale for for why we're doing that i think that's a a healthy thing to do rather than just going oh well the guy that plays the piano has heard this on the latest hill song album and uh, now we're going to sing it for the next six months you know i think i think it needs to be a little bit more um you know it has to pass muster i think it's it's better if it does that and then like a more specific question that has some some connection to the previous one is i'm curious which of the new scottish hymns songs that you've put out have really most caught on congregationally whether that's in your own church or the, the the free churches in the north who mix in some modern hymns or wherever else um just for somebody who's listening to this episode and this is their first exposure to new scottish hymns it's always a great place to start with when you're speaking in the realm of congregational music to really have some of the first songs you listen to be the ones that congregations love to sing sure well yes and i think i think not all of our songs are congregational yeah, songs true. Um, and I kind of I write uh, I think being able to get a congregational song out there I think is a is a great uh, goal because I, I think that's one of the highest expressions mm-hmm. of, of music is to find something that the congregation can sing and exalt God with um, so I'm always kind of aiming at that but sometimes uh, the songs that we write are just personal reflection songs mm-hmm. for, for in your headphones when you're going to work um, so I would say Psalm 139, I think, is a, mm-hmm. a is a, we've also Psalm 103, a, okay. wake up, wake up my soul. We sing that a lot in our church. A, Union with Christ, okay. um, which is on our second album. That would be a third. You're the shepherds. A, yes, that's a good song. Quite a lot, and a, try to think what other ones. Um, we've We've got a version of Psalm 16, which is God of Refuge, Be My Saviour, which is on our uh, Joy Will Follow album. And that is um, the tune of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So mm-hmm. people already know the tune, but it's it's a, um, a Psalm paraphrase of Psalm 16. So, yeah. So I think there's there's quite a few on, on each of our albums, but I would say... Uh, those those ones tend to get a lot of traction, um, and I'd I'd actually a woman um, message on Facebook earlier today saying uh, she's in a uh, is it I'm not sure how to pronounce it if it's 
Saint Helena or Saint Helena or some other uh, version of that, but it's a small island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. It's like um, if you go down to Angola and uh, yes, I've heard west. of the island, but I cannot remember how to say it either. Yep. So well, she she messaged me um, to say you know uh, listening to Sam one three nine down here and you know enjoying the fact that it's connecting her to our Scottish roots. So I felt really touched by that. I've got a big. Mm. I'm look, looking up there just now because there's a big map in my wall. Uh, and I love um, just seeing all these different places and thinking, well, that's that's really wonderful. The the songs can can go out into the world and and be of use to people. Do you know, I just I love that. It's such an exciting uh, idea. It's really encouraging. It is exciting. So one more general question, and then we can move into the how people can keep up with you sort of conclusion <coughs> conclu conclusion matters. Uh, I was uh, re-listening this morning to an interview I listened to back when it first came out, I think. Uh, an interview you did on the Him Partial podcast, uh, which they've recently, relatively recently retired the podcast, but uh, anybody who enjoys this podcast would probably enjoy going back and catching dozens of their past episodes. Um, but you were on that podcast, and you mentioned something interesting, um, that you try to carry the sensibility and values of the classic hymn writers like Wesley or Watts, um, as you write. And that was just a passing reference, but I would love to hear you uh, reflect on that thought a little more. Uh, this, the, what, Just what you've seen, and what's resonated with you and what you've seen in the writing of a Wesley or a Watts uh, that, that has a sensibility and a value, you're like, that's something I want to bring forward to the current generation. So uh, Isaac Watts, I could see... Um, particularly, uh, his his poetic sensibility uh, was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I you know he's he's yeah. kind of uh, in terms of just just the way in which he could um, uh, represent the profundity of a truth um, in a way mm -hmm. that really evokes the emotions. Um, you know that's yes. something that I really wanted to emulate, um, and the same same with Wesley. You know, I think you could tell that these people were deeply moved by the truths that they were writing about. Mm -hmm. That you could tell that it was just springing up from um, this uh, deep desire to. Um, express that truth and and to represent it as faithfully as we, we we can. So I think that a lot of contemporary worship music um, doesn't pay that close attention to the poetic um, use of language. And I think a lot of um, mm -hmm. songwriters, ev even ones that, that do it kind of professionally, I think a lot of them will um, settle on something once once it rhymes, once it's true once it rhymes and they mm -hmm. don't really stop to ask actually does this does this make, make my heart you know race, does you know d d did not our hearts burn within mm -hmm. us you know that's that's the kind of thing that you want to feel because music is about helping us to feel the a full force of a truth, you know, that's what I think and poetry, understanding uh, how, how language works I think really can help us to um, use it in support of that so that we're not singing things, we're not kind of singing songs in a way that um, dist distracts from uh, the magnitude of the truth you know if you if I was to say Jesus Christ died for your sins that's a truth and it's a profound mm -hmm. and you know it's possibly the greatest truth of all time but the manner in which I say it to you um, is important too because if I'm if I'm c communicating it like it's or uh, you know it's a, a grey day outside I'm just reporting the weather then I'm actually 
um, doing it a disservice. So I want the words that we sing and the melodies that we use uh, as best they can to support um, the value of the truths that we are singing about. So that's that's the kind of thing that I'm as aspiring mm -hmm. to. I think that's why we're still singing Wesley, we're still singing Watts, um, and, and uh, you know um, all of the the great hymn writers um, today. I, you know, I want my songs to be sung a hundred years from now. That's the, that's the goal. You know, you, you touch on a number of very interesting interesting things there uh, that I've pondered as I've studied the work of the the old hymn writers too. And, you know, an element of it that's closer to the foreground and then the one that's a little more in the background. But the, the foreground that some modern praise songs, some modern hymns have and do well is, you know, the music I grew up on growing up in the 90s in church, the praise choruses were often just response to a truth. Um, the The older hymns have the truth and our response to it. But what they do beyond just having truth in a response is they they really define stakes. And I'm not sure if that's the best term. I haven't come up with a better one. But the uh, hymn writers, especially Watts, Wesley, I'd say John Newton, uh, also do a really did a really good job in their the the lyrics themselves of defining here's why this matters. Not just here's a great truth, uh, but here's a great truth and here's why it matters. It's not just when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, the cross is there and Jesus died. Um, but then you have the, this an immediate response, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt and all my pride. And, and you go through, uh, Watts, just, he brought such stakes. He, he, he would he'd say, this, why, this is why it matters on a global scale. Uh, we're the whole realm of nature mine that yep. we're a present far too small. And and I love this this idea of having intrinsic to the song, here's why this matters. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And <laughs> I think that do you know it's interesting, you know, there are um observations about contemporary uh, hymns where people say, you know, don't just write songs about how you feel and 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 your response mm -hmm. to God. You know, let, let's sing songs about God. And while that's true, mm -hmm. it's also true that your response to it is something that is valuable to God, and it, it's okay to measure that. So I think having something that um a shows that teaches or affirms some truth about God and recognizes it and helps to underline it and express it in a way that shows its magnitude, yeah, shows the, the stakes of, of what that truth means. Um I think that is great. But I don't I don't uh, necessarily say oh it's um it's wrong to a uh, to see what your response is to these things. I think that's perfect. No, exactly. So I think I think there's a point. Yeah, and, and the psalmist yeah. does it as well. I think that's reasonable. Um I also I also see people um complaining about uh, me songs versus us songs and I think there's mm -hmm. a there's a genuine uh, concern there and I I think that um we should write us songs um and it should be about us, you know, because there's a communal experience and and the truth of the gospel is a uh, fully uh, articulated and understood in within the Christian community, and that's how it's designed to do. So it should certainly be us. But what I'm I'm wary of is um, expecting a song to do too much, you know, because a song a song yes. can only can only one do song so can't yes, do everything. That's right. So some people will say well, there's not really that much gospel in this song. And you say, well, well, it's a, it's a Sam paraphrase, do you know? So mm -hmm. do we have to, do we have to write a verse that talks about the crucifixion in every single song or, you know, because surely a, a Sam on its own is still valuable to us, even if it, if it doesn't necessarily, exactly. if it's not Christological and, 
you know. So, um, you know, Christ is everywhere in the truth of Scripture because he is the truth. Um, but uh, it's not, it doesn't behoove the songwriter to uh, articulate that in every single song. And a song is a um, fragile thing as well. Do you know, sometimes it's going to be imperfect, but you just have to kind of put it out there um, as long as it's not deceptive or um, speaking some kind of falsehood or something. Um, sometimes the song is just, it's imperfect and there's nothing really you can do about it, but there's something of value in there. So, you you know, so I'm, I'm a wee bit kind of a protective sure. of, of songwriters, but I also want to hold myself and hold all of us to a higher standard as well as we're, as we're writing, you know, just, just because the line ends in grace doesn't mean uh, the next line should be about um, God's face. Do you know, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's more to it than that. Definitely. And I completely agree. We can't ask one song to do everything. Yeah. And I don't want to critique songs as somebody who's never tried to write, tried writing myself. I want to, you know, but, but, but I, I do agree. No one song can do everything. And I also agree that we can't hold the songs we sing to higher standards than the Psalms themselves, because we're directly commanded in scripture in the New Testament twice, Ephesians and Colossians, uh, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. We're called to sing the psalm still, yep. as well as hymns and spiritual songs, yep. which, of course, there's some debate over what exactly those two words mean. Don't need to get into that here necessarily. But we're still commanded to sing the psalms. And if we're commanded to sing them, and something is characteristic of some or many of the psalms, that is something that is appropriate for Christians to still sing a song that has those characteristics. Yeah. And, you know, like, we've been, we've been talking for a while, and here's something that yeah. I want to encourage people who are listening to this, who are who are still uh, listening to this and haven't fallen asleep with me droning on is uh, <laughs> you know actually try consciously to factor in time for not just listening to Christian music but actually singing it as well so like if mm -hmm. you have if, if you live with your family or if you've a spouse um, this is something that I, I should really do more myself I love singing with my wife she's, she's a great harmonizer she sings in my worship team at church as well but um, I need to just sit down and sing with her more because I think actually doing that, there is something that happens. There's something organic about um, the way music works. You know, the fact that it has harmony and it has patterns and it, it, it affirms some of the great fundamental truths about delineation, about um, the way a melody sh should go there and not there. And these chords should should work, and these chords don't. You know that kind of um, affirmation of beauty that just happens all on a kind of almost subconscious level when we're when we're making music. It's good. It enriches the soul, and I I encourage people to do mm -hmm. it. So uh, when folks are finished listening to me with my long droning um, sentences, they could go and listen to some good music. So that's what I recommend they do. Yeah, that is, it is a really good practice, whether you call it family worship, family altar, whatever the word, it is a very good thing for Christian couples and Christian families uh, to sing together. And my wife and I have a, a three-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter, and we're starting to teach them some of the grand old hymns. We like try to do one a month, just maybe I'll teach them a verse or two, but they actually remember a surprising amount of them a year later. Yeah. Um, so we're working on it, and it's it's a blessing. And it, it also shows me if a song <laughs> works when you're singing it a cappella, no instruments with a three year old and a two year old. Uh -huh. That's a song that has some staying well, power. Well, yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, definitely. And I'm, I'm trying actually, I'm definitely. trying to write some more um, children's worship as well. Um, oh, that would be know, great. I'm, I'm trying to engage with the idea of, you know, what should a children's song actually be? The, the thing, the songs that I grew up with um, that still hold value for me, like, um, Jesus loves me this I know or wide wide is the ocean mm -hmm. and things like that you know I, I I'm trying to distill down what what is the kind of what is it about those kind of songs that really um, are are things that I don't just throw out when I become an adult but things that actually still mean something to me you know so more of those are, are coming I'm sure in the in the coming months I've noticed a factor that really seems to work with the songs that resonate with uh, my kids is um, 
a simple, catchy chorus. Mm -hmm. And catchy is always hard to define, but a chorus is not overcomplicated. Because if there's a chorus they can understand first, and like first, second, third, listen through a song, they can follow along with a chorus. Then they're a lot more likely to come along and learn all the verses where there's a lot more, yes. a lot more content. Because they're looking for the patterns, I suppose, in in the first instance, the things mm -hmm. that they can recognize and remember. Yep, yep. Yeah, like redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Or I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. With the how wonderful, yep. how marvelous, how wonderful chorus. Yep. Those like they really latch on to because there's there's great depth in the verses of both of those songs. But there's very simple choruses. They like get the chorus first, and then they come into the well, verses. You see, this is this is, That's this is why us. I love hymns. Um, you know, because yes. they have a refrain. You know, some hymns have a refrain, um, or some hymns are just a, a, a series of verses repeated, but they they don't have a bridge and i don't like bridges generally you know i think i think a bridge is quite yeah. a kind of um you know it, the bridge is there to kind of distract from when things get boring you know in a contemporary pop song or mm -hmm. whatever and you know i don't have a huge beef with it but i just think that um when you're trying to teach people something new two things is possible three things is more challenging and that's why the bridge i think i always mm -hmm. you, you don't have there aren't many bridges in many of my songs for yes. that reason. Well, most of our podcasts go 45 minutes to an hour. Or we're actually a couple minutes over an hour at this <laughs> point, so I thank you for being so generous with your time. I'm very appreciative. Um, and uh, as we conclude, I'd love to uh, ask if there's anything you'd like to share with the listeners about recent or forthcoming projects, and whether it be website or social media or elsewhere, how, how best <coughs> listeners can keep up with what you're doing online. Um, okay, uh, newscottishhymns.com is our website and we actually have sheet music for all of our songs on there. Um, we've got like orchestral parts for a lot of the, the stuff from our latest album um, and I'm going to be uh, releasing I think from now on I'm going to be releasing songs and then we'll bundle them together in an album when when we've got enough together mm -hmm. rather than waiting until we've got enough you know you know and then you're not hearing anything for two years so uh facebook our, our facebook new scottish hymns on facebook is how you'll find us and uh, that's where we tend to interact on social media and um yeah i just i'd love if anybody uh, uh, follows us on the basis of that i'd love them to just drop us a message on facebook and say hey i heard you on this a podcast and it would be great to to hear your story as well sounds good all right uh thank you again and i would conclude by saying to the listeners if you enjoyed this episode please share it with a friend and subscribe to catch future episodes you can also find past episodes and the free fifty-eight thousand entry expository songs searchable database at danielmount.com thank you for listening